All right, guys, since I was a slacker and didn't read a whole lot last week, I am going to do an, a few extra chapters today. All right, so here comes chapter seven of Scumble. No, 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 I whispered as my savvy continued to tear the barn apart. Mom and Dad and even Fedora stayed by me. I could feel everyone else looking from me to the clanking, clunking, collapsing barn. I could hear people murmuring to each other as the smell of sawdust filled the air. Stop, Ledge, stop! Mom's words, Mom said the words over and over. But the words alone couldn't make me stop, and she couldn't find a way to smile. I kept my head down, trying to stop, wishing that I knew how. Ledger, look at me, Dad kept saying. Just take a breath and look at me. I couldn't even meet Dad's eyes, not while I was destroying everything around me. I knew I was a disappointment to him in every possible way. I'd never get to run the half marathon now. One false step and I'd topple the water tables and dismantle the guardrails. I'd deconstruct the marathon clocks into split second parts and pieces. Or worse, bust the bolts out of a row of porta potties in the smelliest cataclysm ever. Hearing a loud pop, I looked up in time to see two thick cables crash down into the garden, sparking and snapping like electric eels caught on dry land. Watch the power cables, someone shouted. No one go near them. I suppose you all want me to do something with those, I heard Rocket say. If you'd be so kind, Autry answered, his voice quick and tight as he shepherded kids and old people farther away from the mounting wreckage. Happy belated birthday, Ledge, Rocket growled as he moved past me toward the garden, picking his way carefully toward the falling electric electrical lines. Rocket, Fee called out, making him turn. Avoid the worst. Put safety first. No worries, little cousin, he called back with a smile, lit by the fitful flashes coming from the down lines. Just don't try this at home. As Rocket's gaze fell across me, his smile vanished. The look that replaced it was sharp enough to make me suck in my breath. Rocket moved into the garden, stopping at the place where the cables twitched and seized among the radishes, igniting the air with lethal-looking bolts. My mouth went dry as I watched my cousin pick up the fallen electrical lines like they were as harmless as a pair of green garden hoses. Pulling the two cables together in one hand, he clamped his other hand down over the sparking ends and held on tight. Electric currents shot up his arm and danced around his neck and chest. After draining the cables, Rocket moved back in my direction. Lit up and crackling, he came to a halt ten feet away. At what I hoped was a good, safe distance between an electric man and a demolitions boy. His shoulders rose and fell with every breath, and the air around him seethed and shimmered. I tried to swallow, but couldn't. My heart thumped so hard I thought it might explode. Instead, with a crack like thunder, the last beams of the barn's roof fell in at once. Creaking and groaning, the walls followed, sending shards of wood flying in every direction. There was a sudden cry, and all heads turned. You're hurt! Nellie's voice was soft as she tenderly touched Fish's cheek. In the pale wash of blue light coming from Rocket, everyone could see the drops of blood that marred the front of Melly's wedding dress. My cousin wasn't badly hurt, but his cheek was bleeding, gouged by something sharp and airborne, a nail or a splintered piece of wood. I knew Fish's injury could have been much worse and was glad I was already on my knees. It made saying a prayer of thanks that much easier. Bitsy pushed her wet nose under my mom's arm, trying to give me a big, sloppy, reassuring dog kiss. The savvy monster inside me had worn itself out. The barn was like a straw hat sat on by an elephant. It couldn't get any flatter. The awful prickling sensation was beginning to ebb. My hands no longer itched. <sighs> Why is it always my face? Fish asked Melly. Fish asked as Melly pressed a kerchief to his cheek. A mizzling smatter of raindrops licked the gravel around us, triggered by the pain in Fish's cheek. But he could scumble his savvy, no problem, and the paltry rainfall ended as quick as it began. As soon as Rocket saw that Fish and Melly were all right, he charged toward me, stomping so close I could feel every hair on my head and my arms stand up. You've got to be more careful, Ledger, Rocket shouted. You'd better learn that quick. Back off, son. My dad was on his feet, stepping between me and Rocket. I opened my mouth to say something. Say anything. Sorry, maybe. But before I could form a single word, a siren chirped in the distance, and Rocket turned sharply. 
there was a collective gasp from the assembled crowd. No one could mistake the sight or sound of the sheriff's vehicle rumbling down the gravel road toward us. Rocket took off in a blur headed for the hills. Of all the things that would be difficult to explain to the sheriff, Rocket's bright blue glow just might top the list. But as the truck drew nearer, I couldn't help notice the dark gap where the driver's door should have been. And I knew I might have had, I might have some of my own explaining to do. At that moment, if Grandpa Bamba had had the strength to make the earth open wide and swallow me whole, I would have let him do it. That's the end of the chapter. <laughs>